we're pretty aggressive with venous thrombolysis, you know, when it's convenient. So we, we sort of uh, take the idea that, and I'm going to show you why I think it's important. And, you know, you saw all this. I mean, if, if you add what we learned in the very, you got, anybody remember what the first talk today was on? Yeah, you remember those pictures of the guy standing next to it? So this, is, this talk really is about you guys. For the next 30 years, you're going to be standing wearing lead next really close to a table, and your legs are going to get radiated, right? And so this is important because this is going to happen to you probably. <laughs> Where am I pointing? So DVT, PE, management versus treatment. What am I talking about? Do we treat <coughs> DVTs? How do you treat DVTs? Anybody? Anticoagulation. That's not a treatment for DVT. That doesn't do anything to the DVT, right? That's a nihilist approach to treating DVT. All it does is theoretically prevent what? Pulmonary embolization. So that's what you're trying to do. And Eunice is going to talk about that. But you know better than that. That's not treatment. Treating a DVT would be getting rid of it somehow, right. So the goals of uh, treatment would be prevent death from PE, that's treating a sequela of, P of a DVT, prevent post-thrombotic syndrome so that none of us have those kinds of legs that we see and we don't want, to restore vein patency, to maintain especially venous valvular function and potentially prevent recurrence. So makes you miserable, post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, I think that they, this is part of the slide set because I think I've been saying this for so many years, but yeah, it does make you miserable. There's nobody worse in your clinic than the people with post-thrombotic syndrome. And there's nothing that you can do really in the end that makes those people happier. Significant healthcare costs, incidence uh, reduced with compressive therapy, poor patient compliance. Yeah, so, you know, what we always tell our patients who have uh, insufficiency is that, yes, compression stockings work, but they don't work if they're in your drawer, right? <laughs> and if you've tried to put them on, you know what I'm talking about. They can be really complicated, especially for older people. I just love this, and so we keep it in there. <laughs> you got to read, read what she says. It says, feel the soft ripple. Refreshing comfort of the sequential compression sleeves. Nobody's going to use that at home, I'm just telling you. Maybe in Asia. Okay. Extrinsic pathway. This is the coagulation cascade. We're going to have a little quiz with this at the end of the deal to see if you can go on to your second year. Uh, the fascinating thing is that you can go all over the world give and talk about venous disease and not actually know this. I can just tell you that from personal. <laughs> so, but, Braxa doesn't actually work on the 10 That's the one thing that's wrong. Who picked it up? Braxa is a direct thrombin inhibitor. But in your career, you're going to see that the 10 inhibitors, are, my predictions, will replace Coumadin therapy for a lot of this stuff, right? One of the complaints that people have had is that, well, we can't really reverse it like we can Coumadin. But it's very short acting, which is sort can be a, a negative, too, because if you don't take one of your pills 12 hours from now, you're no longer anticoagulated, right? But it's so much easier in the sense that you don't have to have your blood checked. You know you're anticoagulated. You don't have to worry about what you're eating. People like it a lot better. So we use it as our first line for DVTs. Uh, back to post-thrombotic syndrome. So predictors are recurrent, same-sided DVT, increased thrombus burden, poor anticoagulation therapy. The fundamental pathophysiology with post-thrombotic syndrome is that you mess up the valves and you have obstruction and the valves no longer work to move the blood up like an elevator. So there was a antithrombotic therapy for venous thromboembolism uh, white paper put out uh, talking about what the uh, best evidence was for how you manage things. Don't totally agree with a lot of it, but most of it's okay. So there's low molecular weight or fractionated heparin. The benefit of those is you can give them through injections. You can give them to people to take home. And, you know, we used to worry about teaching them. Now they just sort of give you like a YouTube video and say, have at it and a <laughs> prescription for Walgreens, right? <laughs> so, but in terms of the medications, if you're using a 10A inhibitor, it's pretty interesting. So we will give some, if somebody's on heparin in the hospital, we'll give them the, we'll turn the heparin off and give them their pill and watch them take it. And as the heparin goes down in efficacy, the other one comes back up. So you don't have to wait for a long time to get the cumin and 
on board to work. So what about thrombolysis? So again, if it's you, anybody in this room, and you have ephemeral or iliac DVT, you're going to want to have that out of there so that you have a chance of getting your valves to work again and you don't have this risk of, of, of um, post-thrombotic syndrome. So how do we do that? So this is just talking about, again, the arguments for doing it, but I want to get to actually how we do it. So up to 15% of people will develop an ulcer if they've had a bad DVT. 40% will have venous claudication. 90%, if you measure it, will have venous ambulatory hypertension. So we want to tr try to get rid of the clot so we can preserve endothelial function. We can keep the valves functioning. And uh, clot resolution within 90 days usually preserves function, which gets to the point of you're going to see in here that somebody says, well, you should do this if you can do it within two weeks. But in reality, we do it whenever we find it in a good patient because we can get pretty good results even if we think it's been there for a while. So the, the concept of, yes, if you lice it today, it lices a lot easier, but you can still do people with chronic occlusions and improve upon their symptoms. What we, the data we have isn't perfect because a lot of it has to do with pooled registries. But if we look at that data, we see that anticoagulation alone, 82% of those patients really had no improvement in their symptoms. Thrombolysis, almost two-thirds did. There was technical success in getting out some or all of the clot and the bleeding complications, which were originally uh, one of the reasons people didn't want to do it because we were using urokinase for two and three and four days, um, was higher. I think it's less now. We try to get somebody's clot out, some, either a combination of using lytic therapy and mechanical devices pretty much by tomorrow. You know? So we'll give them a combination of doing one first, either the mechanical thrombectomy device or the lytic therapy, and then we'll bring them back. And most of the time, we can get the thing opened up in 24 hours. So I think that's reducing the risk of bleeding complications. And when they looked at quality of life, it was significantly improved in patients who had the clots actually taken out. So again, one of the things that it does is it also allows you to correct the underlying lesion. So uh, a 20 eight-year-old woman on birth control pills come in, comes in with a left leg that's swollen, what does she have? Anybody? She has a DVT, yes, but there's more to it than that. They <laughs> thermes, right. The, which is the, where the, right, you have the aorta and the vena cava, right, and so the right iliac artery sits on top of the left iliac vein and it compresses it. And if you see it, in a normal person, you'll see, wow, that's really kind of pushing down on it, you know? So why do pregnant women uh, not get DVTs every time and yet later have problems with vein problems with their valves? It's because the baby in utero <coughs> sits right there on the vena cava, right? That's why you lean to the side at the end of your pregnancy and your legs get swollen. That often shows up later in life as valvular incompetence. These are just some of the devices that we have used. Uh, these are mechanical removers of clot. This is a wire that's an ultrasound emitter that helps break up the clot. So it can be, it's approved to be used in DVTs as well as pulmonary emboli. This is a patient. This is one of the um, women that works in our office, actually. She went to, her, she, you know, her leg hurt, and uh, she went to her family doctor, and he put her on muscle relaxants, which are actually not effective, it turns out, in eliminating DVT. <laughs> So what we do, uh, t you know, we used to go retrograde or antegrade, depending on how you want to call it, from the popliteal, worrying that the valves would preclude our ability to get down. But we don't do that anymore. We quit doing it because people don't like to be turned over, and they don't like to lay in the ICU even for 24 hours on their stomach. It makes it hard to eat and other things. So now what we do is we actually go up. You can see I put a filter in first. You see all of this clot, right, in this left iliac system. But using a glide wire and glide catheter technique, getting a sheath over, you can actually get all the way down into the, the leg. This is more clot, and you can watch this thing move. And that's why I think if you have a big clot burden, it's important to use a filter. So we use, we, it used to be a bigger deal when we couldn't take them out. But once we can take the filters out, it's not such a big deal. I didn't want to like trade a, for a 24-year-old person having a filter all their life, you know, for the benefit. And in this, I probably would have even now that we can remove them, 
weed out of it and do it all the time. And again, so now I've got moving my sheath down, moving my catheter down. Now I'm, this is about the thigh. See, every, there's the knee. It's just filled with thrombus. And we can get, the other thing, if we do a popliteal approach, I never liked the fact that one, I wasn't taking care of anything below it, and two, when I took it out, well, you just have the whole pressure on it, right? There isn't really a good closure left of it, and so I was always afraid that I would re-thrombose it. So this up and over technique allows me to go all the way down into the tibials, and then as we give TPA up through the, the sucrose catheter, you know, it's all going in the right direction, right? So it continues to lyse as it moves through the venous system. This is after lysing for 12 hours or so. And you can actually see the valves work. Now this is um, below her knee, all the way through her popliteal, up into her superficial femoral vein, or her femoral vein, as we were instructed, it is called. And this is all open through her thigh. But what do you think I'm going to find in the iliac? It's usually not quite uh, as nice when you finish, right? Because that's where it started. You can see not only, and it's, uh, May Turner's is, is almost often not a simple, acute process. It's something that's gone on and recanalized, gone on and recanalized. And so you get all these webs and synechiae inside the veins. So here's where we'll use the, now I'll use the mechanical thrombectomy device to clean out as much of it as I can. And then, let's see, I think we have one more picture towards the end, and then we'll need to stent it. So here we're going to use a self-expanding stent. It needs to be a pretty big stent. You can see, first I'm ballooning, the, I'll try to get the webs and synechiae out coming from up and over with a 12 millimeter balloon. It's a pretty big balloon. And then, well, the downsides with this up and over technique is to put the stent in, I've got to go up the femoral. So I will stick the recently opened common femoral on that side and use an 18 millimeter or 16 millimeter wall stent. They're the only ones that are big enough. You have to use a wall stent in this instance because there aren't enough, uh, there's not large enough diameters with night and all stents. But we're going to go take it right up to the origin of the You know, who knows, because they, they're really big, you can't tell. The one thing about a wall stent that is good is you can recapture it too, because it's a stupid stent. It foreshortens 30% from both ends, you know. But what we do, you need at least probably for an iliac a 16, you know. You can size it with that balloon and see how it looks. So that's what we usually do is we put in a big balloon and then figure out, you want it bigger than the thing. But if it's too big, then it becomes really long. So this is her uh, two days later. So this is her when we started on Friday night, and that's her when she was discharged on, on uh, Sunday morning. And she went home, and we used, at the time, we used Pradax on her and then took her, uh, took her filter out about six months later. And that's the question. The last thing we'll go over is the sort of the questions of how long do you keep people on anticoagulation anymore. Three months, if, it's, if we don't really know why, it's their first episode of DVT, we'll do three, and we'll do three months, and then rescan it, and if everything's stable, stop it. If they have a second unprovoked DVT, then they need long-term treatment because they likely have an, a hypercoagulable state. Again, for, if you know what it is that's causing it, you can make your decisions based upon the clinical relevance of that. It may be caused by trauma, right? And so then they probably don't need long-term anticoagulation once their trauma risks are, are taken care of. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Yes, sir. Down in the, so the test. You, going over the top, do you think you get further distal? I can get to the ankle. It's fascinating. So that's how I taught people for a long time to do it, yeah. and how we did it was we put them prone. We used the ultrasound, or at least I would hold the ultrasound probe <laughs> over it as I stuck it. And, you know, if you think about it, it's easier to get it in the vein when it's got a bunch of clot in it because it's huge, right? But you can definitely see that with the ultrasound. But this technique of going up and over 
it's interesting, even in a patient who doesn't have a lot of clot, you can still get through every valve with a glide wire and a glide cath all the way down into the caffeine. So I think they like it a lot better, and then it precludes that problem of accessing the popliteal, you know, and what the injury that you create there. So I would suggest that. You need a sheath, you know, so we have, you have to get your sheath up and over through the whole thing too. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, not really for the DVT. The, the, the anticoagulation is not for the stent. Anybody who has a stent, I put them on antiplatelets for the rest of their life if they can take it. So any, anybody that we put gear in. And obviously off the birth control pills, which are hypercoagulant.